Hello, Pod World. Welcome to episode one of the Silver Hedgehog Hogcast. I'm your host, Gary Llewellyn, aka the Silver Hedgehog. I'm a bit of a film nerd and self-confessed geek, and I really love watching films. In fact, one of my earliest film memories is sitting at home with mum and dad, being plunked in front of our old telly, and being made to watch Elvis Presley's Blue Hawaii. The telly was black and white, and it needed 50p put in the meter just to keep it going. Fast forward four decades, and I'm still watching films, albeit no longer with the 50p meter. And around a year ago, I started to write about them for my website, thesilverhedgehog.com. Taking that a step further, I've created this podcast, I mean, podcast, uh, to provide an audible version of my reviews and the features and invite friends and guests to join conversations along the way. However, for this, my first episode, I'm going solo and I've picked a film to talk about. That film is A Call to Spy. I hope you enjoy my Dorset tones. Now on with the Hogcast. Just before I talk about A Call to Spy, I wanted to share with you why I find films so amazing and how the SilverHedgehog.com reviews films. Firstly, it does not matter if it's a comic book movie, a billion dollar three hour epic, a dark horror or a biopic. Films have the capacity to entertain us, let us forget about the stresses of life, educate us and I find that absolutely amazing. Films are definitely worth shouting about. And every movie starts with someone's great spark of an idea. It's just the implementation of that idea that varies in quality. Many reviews simply provide a gut reaction, a star rating is then given. There's no thought or attention given to all the hundreds of dedicated people uh, that have worked on that film in areas such as script, casting, music, visual effects and video quality. And that's what we want to look at at thesilverhedgehog.com. So when we provide a review, we're going to consider all of those points. So for example, casting, does the casting choices work? Do the actors bring the characters to life? Points are lost if something feels off or it's evident the actors are miscast. Or just not giving a damn and just turning up for a paycheck. Music and score, does the music suit the film? Or has have they been lazy and just put a temp track on and just adjusted something just to make sure it you know, gets around copyright. Visual effects and costumes. Do the visual effects suit the film? And the budget? Are they finished? Do they look good? Do they stick out for the wrong reasons? Points are going to be lost for shoddy looking effects and shoddy looking costumes. And video quality. What does the film look like on screen? Has the director of photography done an absolutely amazing job? Or is it just filmed quickly? Get it over the line, get it out. If we notice something rubbish in the filmmaking or a low quality presentation, we'll drop it off the points. And come on, films really should be in at least 4K by now, people. So, each category gets a score out of 10. We do some clever hedgehog maths, and then an overall score is provided. And the ratings vary from 1 to 10. A film that catches a rating between 9 and 10 gets our must-watch rating. These films are technically exceptional. They capture the zeitgeist of the moment. All of our criteria gel together and the script, casting, music score, visual effects and costumes come together and work flawlessly. These films are definitely memorable, definitely watchable and definitely talked about. And that is what we're aiming for. So, now you know all about why we review films and how we review films, it's time to review A Call to Spy. So, what's A Call to Spy about? You've got to picture this. It's the early part of World War II. The Nazis have taken over pretty much all of Europe, and Churchill has famously ordered his SOE agents to set Europe ablaze through espionage, sabotage, and any other charge they can think about, whilst building a resistance network across Europe. Consequently, Britain is sending male spies abroad that are killed or captured as fast as they could be trained. A radical rethink was needed, so spy mistress Vera Atkins convinces Colonel Morris Bookmaster, the leader of the French section, that women are needed to be implemented as spies. After some hesitancy, and the top brass insisting the women needed to be very pretty, the aptly nicknamed Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare sets out to recruit and train women as both spies and radio operators. Amongst these first recruits 
are Virginia Hall and Noor Anayat Khan. The film splits its time between Britain and France following the activities of these three women. A Call to Spy shows us a glimpse of how stoic these women were and what they had to endure from the sexist British army through to Nazis who had zero moral compass, all for very little credit and reward from their country. The film is produced, written and directed by Sarah Megan Thomas. It stars not only Thomas, but Stanya Katik, Radik Apte, Linus Roach. Inspired by the women's story, Thomas has created a detailed screenplay from diligent research, you know, talking with family members as well to get accounts for real life events. And all of this has been woven into the film. Now it's time to talk about the key cast and real life characters of A Call to Spy. First up is Stanya Katik as Vera Atkins. Anybody that's watched Castle Absenti recently knows that Katik is tremendous at her job. And watching A Call to Spy shows she's passionate about the story being told and this enthusiasm radiates from her performance. And Katik arrives on screen supporting a quintessential women's 1940s accent. It's an accent full of elocution and seems quite over the top. I find it quite amusing until a funny accent is addressed in the film and then it becomes clear. Pronounced elocution aside, Katik dominates the screen and she dominates the scenes that she's in. Schooling spies, walking the tightrope between being subservient and dominant men in power and rightly pushing her own forthright agenda. Katik's performance of Vera Atkins now has a persona that became a role model for female recruits. After the film, I dug a little deeper into Vera Atkins' story, and it's evident that what is shown on screen is an excellent introduction to this formidable woman's story. It turns out Vera Atkins is a Romanian Jewish immigrant that joined the French section of the SOE in 1941. She became the assistant to the head of F section, Colonel Morris Bookmaster, who we'll talk about shortly, thus becoming the de facto intelligent officer while at the same time pushing to become a British national and fully awarded a commission in the forces. It wasn't plain sailing for Atkins though, and those in power were suspicious of the immigrant, especially as Atkins is a Romanian who had not yet obtained British citizenship. Technically, this made Atkins an illegal enemy of state and highly vulnerable. She also had some controversy with her spy network. There were suspicions of negligence and letting Bookmaster make errors at the expense of agents' lives. That included 27 British spies arrested on landing which were subsequently killed. And she almost caused the collapse of the French intelligence network and resistance as well. But despite these controversies, Atkins was successful in obtaining both citizenship and a military commission. She became a flight officer in the Women's WAF and she ultimately became F Section's intelligence officer. But Atkins' story doesn't end there. At the end of the war, she was determined to uncover the fates of 51 still unaccounted for F6 and agents. This work indirectly led to the creation of what we now know as MI6, and she succeeded in finding the fate of all but one of the spies, many of which which gained posthumous awards. Next to talk about is Radhika Apte as Noor Anayat Khan. And the great news is Apte delivers as Noor Anayat Khan, a displaced princess of a forgotten land. A pacifist by nature caught up in the hell of war, Khan goes through so much in the film, starting out as a determined but timid young woman, being spotted as a talent for a radio operator, being deployed into France and being subjected to a range of experiences that would break the average person. Apte's performance is assured, believable, bringing to screen the raw emotions and experiences Khan is going through. Apte is perfectly cast. After the film, I found out more about Khan. Her father, Ainat Khan, came from a family of Indian Muslims that were hereditary nobles. Noor had to take responsibility for her family at the age of 13 due to the death of her father. Afterwards, she went on to study child psychology and music in Paris and became a, a writer in her early life. However, in June 1940, when France was invaded by German troops, the family fled, ending up in Falmouth in Cornwall. Although Noor was deeply influenced by pacifist ideals, she decided to help defeat the Nazi tyranny, so she joined the WAF. This set her on a path to become a wireless operator, and her fate was sealed as an SOE agent. The next person to talk about is Linus Roach, as Maurice Bookmaster. Now, Bookmaster is your typical upper-crust British officer, reporting to those on the floor above. 
He does not overtly give the women a hard time, but you can sense there's real hesitancy in his actions. And Roach plays his character perfectly. He could have gone more over the top and been really brash, but he finds the right balance of assertiveness and steadfast dedication to his cause. He also has an excellent on-screen relationship with Katik, and Roach uses this to play off Katik in some really demanding scenes. And looking up Buttmaster of the film, I discovered he was a Staffordshire lad with an aptitude for study. He moved over to France, he became fluent in French, he worked for a paper, he moved into banking, and then over to the Ford Motor Company in Europe, setting up sales offices. At the outbreak of the war, Bookmaster returned to Britain, enlisted and was sent back to Europe with an expeditionary force. After the failure of Dunkirk, his talents were needed in intelligence, so he ultimately assumed command of the F section of the SOE. During his time in F section, he controlled 400 agents, and controversially, it said many of them perished due to his leadership. At the end of the war, Allied Commander General D. Dwight Eisenhower said the F section had helped shorten the war by six months. Colonel Bookmaster also rejoined the Ford Motor Company, serving in Dagenham as the Director of Public Affairs. No review would be complete without talking about Sarah Megan Thomas as Virginia Hall. Until I watched A Call to Spy, I didn't know anything about either Sarah Megan Thomas or Virginia Hall. And as it turns out, Thomas is an extremely capable actress, writer and producer. Virginia Hall is an American with dreams of becoming a diplomat, only to be turned down due to having a wooden leg. The newly formed SOE see an opportunity to use this brash American as the perfect spy, and Virginia's story begins. Thomas's portrayal shows a woman that must face the daily battle and pain of having a wooden leg, and the laser-focused determination of succeeding where men had failed. Virginia Hall had a point to prove on so many levels. And Thomas is not afraid to let this emotion and vulnerability play out on screen. In fact, a scene where Virginia mentally contemplates crossing the mountains whilst preparing her squeaky wooden leg cuthbert is the most poignant of the entire film. And reading Virginia Hall's story after the film, it's obvious that A Call to Spy only scratches the surface of what is accomplished in France. Not only was Virginia Hall the first woman spy to remain in France for any lengthy period of time, she also helped stranded service men, she worked out how to set up a resistance network, put together ways of working that infuriated the Germans. In fact, the Gestapo considered her the most dangerous of all the Allied spies. And Virginia Hall was so laser-focused in liberating France, nothing would stop her from this mission. So whether it was escaping over the Pyrenees, organising jailbreaks, or even returning to France for a second time with a new identity, Virginia Hall's exploits supported several high-target Allied operations. After the war, Hall was awarded an MBE, and was recruited into a brand new American agency, the CIA. Now it's time to talk about the production values of A Call to Spy. I watched A Call to Spy on Blu-ray, rented from Cinema Paradiso. I found the picture to be actually really good, although slightly grainy in parts, especially the lower light scenes. But nothing actually terrible and nothing too detracting from the film, which was great. I also noticed at the time of recording, A Call to Spy is now launched on Netflix, and Netflix are showing it in HD only. The effects were really good uh, as well in A Call to Spy, and I noticed that Budapest stood in for Paris, and the attention to detail was really, really spot on. There were highly obvious Nazi propaganda, such as the flags appearing on the side of buildings, but also subtle nuances, such as shop windows, or even uh, anti-Nazi graffiti, sprayed on the side of steps and street signs. The period costumes uh, being used also seem to be spot on and also looked really really good. The soundtrack and the score provided in DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 the surround track provides an excellent ambience. Birds sing in the countryside, trains puff loudly at stations. The centre channel is the star of the show and is mixed brilliantly with crisp clear dialogue. Lily Rebecca McDonoghue is on composer duties and has created a measured score that reflects the film well. It's not bombastic or indeed memorable, but it is a pleasure to listen to alongside the film. Its orchestral tone doing the job of enhancing the on-screen images very well. Refreshingly, 
I did not notice any score influences from other films, which is a super job really. The only problem is, if you want to listen to the score separately, unfortunately I've not been able to locate it separately on any streaming surface or available in a shop. Now it's time for our overall thoughts of A Call to Spy. And for all the good the film does, it does have a few issues. Firstly, it doesn't really figure out what it wants to be. As a thriller, it doesn't really quite work. The pacing is off. As a biopic, it kind of works. However, it's an ensemble film, so the screen time is rationed across all the main cast, which causes pacing issues and expedited character development. We get a film that flicks between the UK and France, spending too little time in either, and this results in a total lack of tension in parts. For example, we have a drail break scene that starts off well, loses momentum, so ultimately all we do is end up watching a game of Monopoly being played. And I know what they're going for, but it just completely misses the mark. In another scene, a group of spies are almost captured, but you never feel that they're at risk. Two hour runtime may seem long, but it's nowhere near long enough to convey the journey this group of people are enduring. A bigger story has yet to be told, and I think A Call to Spy would benefit from a serialised three-part film rather than one two-hour shortish type of film that is speedily rushing through all of the characters and all of their exploits. Overall though, the attention to detail that Sarah Megan Thomas has instilled into production has to be acknowledged. I enjoyed watching Call to Spy and I think it's highlighted aspects of World War II that I was completely unaware of. So on that level, it totally works. It's also started conversations about Vera Atkins, Virginia Hall and Noor Anayat Khan, and this helps to keep those ladies' memories alive. And whilst I was writing this review, I was told of some great memorials to women in London, as well as a World War II podcast, We Have Ways of Making You Talk, that explore key aspects of World War II and these are something I'd never have come across on my own. So now it's time to find out the all-important Silver Hedgehog rating. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, we're looking at the script, casting, music, visual effects and video quality in order to give an overall rating. So the script, we gave it 8, casting 10, music 7, Visual effects and costumes 10, and video quality 8. All of that comes out at an 8.6, and that's a Silver Hedgehog recommended rating. Overall, a thoroughly enjoyable film to go out and watch, and I really hope that you do. Well, Pod World, that's the end of the first episode of the Silver Hedgehog Hogcast, and I really do hope you've enjoyed it. Please like us on whatever podcast app or platform you're listening to, subscribe to us, and come over to the Silver Hedgehog Hogcast community on Facebook. We'd love it if you could join in the conversation, perhaps suggest topics for future podcasts, and just get involved generally on what we're up to. Forthcoming podcasts have been planned, and they include a group chat with a couple of friends of mine, and also podcast number three will include an interview with David Moore, who's an historian, photographer, entrepreneur, and chairman of the Waterworks Trust in Litchfield. And he's gonna pop on and talk to us about Sandfield's pumping station. And I'm really excited for that. So, I'm gonna go off, plan off the next episode. I'd like you all to stay safe. Thanks again for so much for listening and for tuning in. Hedgehog out. <laughs>